Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and this episode is Q&A number 114. Before we get into today's questions, big thanks to our sponsors. First we have Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Precision Hydration create electrolyte supplements and in particular they help you find out what your individual sweat sodium concentration is and then you can select uh, a supplement that contains a similar concentration of sodium so that you can adequately and accurately uh, replenish the sodium that you lose when you're training or racing because as you deplete your sodium more and more in especially in longer uh, racing and training with uh, with intensity in there your risk of suffering from cramps or decreased performance can increase significantly and that is why it is very important to replace some of that sodium and this is important both in hot and humid conditions but also just in general in training and especially now that a lot of us are training indoors that's an environment where you'll be sweating a lot and you can potentially lose a lot of sodium and suffer decreases in performance and cramps and potentially other consequences uh, if you are not uh, attentive to your sodium needs right now precision hydration are running or from tomorrow and by the time that this episode goes out actually precision hydration will be starting their black friday sale so you can get 20 percent off all electrolytes with the promo code tts friday 20 and if you order more than 100 dollars worth of product you also get a free microfiber towel and this lasts until midnight on Cyber Monday, the 30th of November. So this is in place from the 27th of November to the 30th of November. And remember, the promo code was TTS Friday 20. And big thanks to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka are also running a lot of uh, holiday sales, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, uh, lasting all the way through the 1st of December. So these sales are not uh, compatible with also using the that triathlon show coupon code that you would normally use, but uh, it is well worth it in many cases to just use the the sale because actually those sales discounts can be up to fifty percent. So I just looked at Roka's website, and for example, you can get seventy five euros off various models of sports sunglasses. You can get one hundred forty euros off the Gen 2 Elite Aero Tri-Suit, or you can get 325 euros off the Maverick X2 flagship model wetsuit. So there are some really, really amazing discounts there. This is a great time to go and work on your Christmas shopping on Roka. Get some presents for your triathlon family members, friends, and whoever you might be shopping for. All right, and before we get into the questions, I also have one house cleaning item, which is that tomorrow, which is Friday the 27th of November at 5 p.m. GMT, I will be recording a Q&A episode, a special Q&A episode, together with uh, guest Michael Rosenblatt, who's been a guest before on the podcast twice, actually. We will be doing a Q&A specifically oriented to interval training, Uh, High intensity interval training and sprint interval training is uh, something that Michael has been investigating a lot and we talked about that in a previous episode with him. If you have questions that you want us to tackle because this is a listener Q&A, then please email your questions to me uh, within the next uh, 24 hours or so before 5 p.m. GMT on Friday 27th of November. Uh, And yeah, my email is michael at scientifictriathlon.com and that's michael with a K. And uh, also sign up to the Scientific Triathlon newsletter because uh, on there I sent out information about this a bit more in advance. But yeah, this recording came up uh, on relatively short notice, which is why you haven't heard about it on the podcast until now, kind of last minute. But uh, for that reason, it's good to be on the newsletter as well to stay up to date on topics like this. But let's get on to the questions for today, which are from Jesse, who writes, Hi, Michael. I have a follow-up question on Q&A number 109. In the episode, you said that kilojoules is a training metric you use to measure training, the training stress of your athletes. Can you give some more information on how this metric works in training and what we should be looking for at different points in our training year, specifically for Ironman athletes? Is it something to look at in individual workouts or on a weekly basis or within specific training blocks as a whole? 
While I was looking for more information about this topic, I read a blog post on Wadi Inc. where they discuss how many kilojoules you should be aiming for on your longest training rides in preparation for an Ironman. They claim that basically you should be expending more kilojoules in those long rides than you will be doing on race day. I was wondering what your opinion is on this topic. How many times would I complete a ride like this with more kilojoules expended than my race? And how far out from my goal race would these sessions occur? Finally, even if you don't use the kilojoule metric in this way, what is your opinion on the longest training rides done before an Ironman? Should they be harder than the demands of the race? I followed an 80-20 training plan for my first Ironman and I don't ever remember working that hard in a single workout. Thank you, Jesse. All right. Uh, thank you, Jesse, for your questions. There's basically uh, three of them, three main questions. So we'll tackle them one at a time. Uh, first, a little bit of a preamble. Uh, when monitoring your training load, uh, I would say that you want to be looking at it from not just one perspective, but from at least two and possibly several sub perspectives within those two. But the two main ones are you need to be monitoring both internal load and external load. So examples of internal load would be your heart rate in workouts. It could even be your your resting heart rate, your morning resting heart rate or your morning HRV would be another example of internal load, not within training, but within a training block, for example. External load, on the other hand, would be things like your your average power in a workout, your kilometers that you run or that you bike, or your duration that you run or that you bike. It could be more sophisticated metrics like training stress score, which combines duration and intensity, or kilojoules, which also combines intensity and duration. For a real in-depth discussion on how different load measures, both external and internal, compare, I would refer you to episode 250 of the podcast, which is with Theon Van Erp, who has done a lot of research specifically in that area. So that was a good discussion with Theon. But... Uh, to get back to kilojoules and it accounting for both volume and intensity, let's just start by some simple math. Kilojoules is a measure of work. How much work have you done on the bike, for example? Of course, you could uh, you do work on the run and, and in swimming as well, but on the bike, it's very, very easy to measure if you have a power meter. Uh, so and by the way running power meters uh, is a bit more questionable because we don't really know exactly how well the running power calculated is a measure of actual mechanic work done and also how much how well that relates to to internal uh, work produced uh, so cycling is a great example here and there you would just take your average uh, wattage your average power for a ride multiply that by the duration of your workout in seconds and divide by 1000 and that's how you get the number of kilojoules expended in a session as mechanical work so power that goes into the pedals or work that goes into the pedals this excludes work like heat energy uh, so not work but but uh, energy or joules lost as heat so for example if you ride at one ride for one hour at 150 watts you would take 150 times 3600 divided by, by 1000 and it's 540 kilojoules 200 watts for one hour would be 720 kilojoules and 300 watts for one hour would be 1080 kilojoules so as you see 300 watts is twice the amount of 150 watts and you get twice the amount of kilojoules naturally if we have a cyclist that has a functional threshold power an ftp of 300 watts and they go out and do a steady endurance ride so they ride at 200 watts for three hours then that adds up to 2160 kilojoules and also if we do the math on what that adds up to in training stress score it, it ends up being 135 tss now if the same rider does an interval workout that is the same 200 watts average power but the normalized power due to the variability of high powers and low powers is 250 watts and they do this ride for one hour or the, or the ride, ride lasts one hour and 58 minutes that also adds up to 135 tss but only 1440 kilojoules so the exact same training stress score so in that measure of training load it, it the rides are equally uh, demanding 
but when we look at the kilojoules, the second ride, the intral ride that was shorter but more intense, it still only accounts for two thirds of the kilojoules expended in the first ride. The reason for this is that TSS has a direct linear relationship to duration, but a quadratic relationship to intensity. So you have intensity factor, which is the normal S power of the ride divided by the FTP of the rider. Uh, that is uh, included twice or to the, to the power of two in the formula for TSS. So in other words, it simply weighs intensity more significantly than it weighs duration. Kilojoules, on the other hand, or work, has a linear relationship with both intensity in terms of power and duration. So you could say that it weighs the two equally, or it does. And there are two reasons that I like to use. Or I, I like to use both, but kilojoules to me is more important than TSS. And the reasons for that are as follows. And the first one is that we know from more than a century of development in endurance sports coaching and many decades of scientific research that total duration is a very important component of successful endurance, uh, endurance athletics. So to me, it doesn't make sense to choose a training load metric that so heavily skews towards intensity as a primary ma metric or a measure of training load. Both intensity and volume are, of course, important, but kilojoules, to me, gives a better reflection of what good endurance training should look like. It, In other words, a training stress score in many ways can be seen as a bit of a red herring, if you, especially if you chase training stress score. It's something I talked about quite a bit, so I won't go into detail on that. But uh, that's a common problem that I see in, in endurance sports and in triathletes and cyclists in particular. And the second reason that I like kilojoules more is that it does a better job of allowing the coach and the athlete to understand the true cost of low intensity workouts and metabolically in particular. So if we know that we expended 2160 kilojoules in a ride as mechanical work, then your watch or your head unit on the bike will also tell you how much that is in terms of calories that you expended. And uh, as you probably know, it will be a very similar number to the number of kilojoules expended. So that can tell us a lot about what sort of training we can do the next day or even later that same day. Of course, we also know that with lower intensity workouts, we will be using more fats and less carbs and vice versa. Fat stores are abundant in the body, but make the long rides long enough. And even if they are at a relatively low intensity, the absolute amount of carbs used during that ride will add up such that it should at, very, at the very least be a consideration for planning the next day's training. It might not change it, but it should be considered. In other words, if you just look at TSS, we might not see that a low intensity workout can have an impact on the next day's training. If we look at kilojoules, we can see that much more clearly because of the fact that it actually measures the true energy expended metabolically, or at least it gives us the calories that, that will be expended as well. So, so that is another very important aspect. Now, when and in what context should we look, should we be looking at kilojoules? So for me, I first and foremost do it when analyzing a training week or month or a block of training in general. It's uh, nothing special, really. It's a very routine check of how the week or block stacks up compared to where we wanted it to stack up. So to give you some examples, if we are increasing the training load, then I would expect kilojoules to go up compared to the previous week or block, whatever we're comparing to. If we are in a steady period of training, then I don't really want it to move too much either up or down, or I don't expect it to move too much up or down. And if we are in a taper period, we're entering tapering, then I definitely want it to go down significantly. And if I see that the last week that I'm looking at, for example, if or the previous week, the week that I'm currently analyzing, had significantly more or less kilojoules done than what I would have expected, and it's important here for me to be clear. I don't really have a number spe specifically that I'm expecting the week to have, but I'm looking at the trend of all the previous weeks that the athlete has done. So given the context of what the athlete was doing in weeks before that, that's the context that I'm looking at this as. But uh, anyway, if, if I see something that is way lower than I thought it would be or way higher, then that's a trigger for me to simply dig deeper, assess what this unexpected work is a result of, or maybe just ask the athlete, hey, uh, do you have any idea what's going on here and why this is the case? 
and then that can inform potential decisions about how to how we might modify the training or not but it's it's a routine part of of assessing and analyzing how the training is going so again i never plan a target kilojoule for a training block or a training day or a training month i simply use it retrospectively for monitoring reviewing and informing training decisions in the day-to-day training on a workout level that is kilojoules is not something i pay too much attention to However, there are a couple of exceptions, and namely workouts where we are doing some sort of race specificity. You might call it fatigue resistance if you want to. It could be, for example, doing doing a race-specific Ironman or half Ironman workout where we will be work doing intervals at race intensity, and we will make sure that at least one of those intervals are done at a point where you have expended enough kilojoules that it corresponds to being in your let's say last quarter of the race and outside of triathlon in cycling it's maybe even more critical that you can for example put out the power to climb at a race winning uh, power after having expended energy all day in the peloton or in the breakaway and and really drained your your energy stores there so so in cycling i i do think it's a critical part of the training that we should be doing when it comes to race specificity to have that type of training and be able to go hard after having expended a certain amount of kilojoules already in training and uh, i do know that the norwegian triathlon team that are known for doing a lot of uh, sophisticated testing and being quite scientific in their approach or very scientific in their approach they do a lot of testing after having spent a certain amount of kilojoules already to get specific data on their athletes when they are in a corresponding physiological state as they will be in the race, for example, on the bike or on the run in an Olympic distance race. One more thing that I should mention here is that over the longer term, so when assessing season-to-season development, looking at kilojoules can be a really, really good measure of of assessing season to season training load changes so let's let's give an example here let's say you go from having an ftp of 280 watts to 300 watts from one season to the next and and let's say that your training remains similar in terms of duration and relative intensity so your average intensity factor or average percentage of ftp then you will be getting a very similar or identical tss training stress score from year to year because again, you have updated your your FTP, so your relative intensity is the same and your duration is the same. So yeah, it will be the same if if we assume that your training is very similar in that way, which which is very, uh, it could very well be the case because if the training is going well, you don't need to be making any dramatic overhauls to it. And this is all well and good. It's good to see that relatively speaking, the relative intensity is the same, for example. That's one thing that's important to monitor. And you might not always want it to remain the same, but you want to be able to monitor that. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't measure this at all. But I also think that if we assume that just because TSS was equal from year to year, your training load was also equal, then I I don't think we're hitting the mark there. Because to give you an extreme example, a 400 watt FTP cyclist riding for three hours at 60% of FTP I would argue that they have a much higher external load than a cyclist with an FTP of 200 watts riding the same three hours at the same 60% of FTP, simply because 60% of 400 is a lot more than 60% of 200. So in fact, the 400 watt FTP cyclist will of course be expending double the amount of energy of kilojoules. So of course they are used to that higher external load. So the internal load may be the same. It may even be smaller. But the external load is still higher when we're looking at the the absolute mechanical work produced. In fact, for that example ride, the difference is 1,700 kilojoules. So just the difference between riding at three hours at an endurance intensity for a 400-watt cyclist versus a 200-watt cyclist would be around the magnitude of uh, simply the the daily metabolic cost of living for a sedentary person like a a woman or maybe a smaller male that uh, doesn't really take much more than 1700 kilojoules or uh, converting to calories something similar in calories to to go through 24 hours of daily living so that's that's very significant and the external load is clearly a lot higher for the cyclist with a higher ftp 
again that's why we need to look at both external and internal load to get the full complete picture but going back to the example of the athlete that increased their ftp from 280 to 300 watts year to year let's say they're a pure cyclist they only ride they don't swim and run and they ride 10 hours per week on average and that's 520 hours per year if we then assume that in year one they their average power for all their cycling was 170 watts and in year two it was 190 watts so it went up by 20 watts when ftp went up by 20 watts then the work done uh, has also increased from let me see here where do i have the numbers 310,000 kilojoules to 356,000 kilojoules so an increase of 11 percent even though the relative intensity or internal load and total duration all stayed the same so what is then what, what what is the lay down here are you doing the same training load in year two as in year one or are you not well the answer is that it depends on your perspective if you look at work done and you, you are training at a higher load in year two there's no question about that the external work is higher and there are things that you need to account for when you look at it from this perspective you need to account for maybe different fueling needs maybe different recovery needs but if you look at relative intensity or measures of internal load then yeah the training load didn't change and that is also important information because that information tells us that we already know from year one that the athlete can handle this particular relative intensity so so we we can be fairly safe that things are going well and uh, maybe that means that we can try to push it up a little bit higher to experiment or maybe we know from previous experience that well that is the limit for this athlete so we just need to stay there what a good coach needs to do is to look at these things from from all the different perspectives and use the ones that are relevant for the athlete in front of him or her in a way that is applicable to what the athlete is trying to to achieve speaking of which uh, coming back to the whole context and context being king I should mention that I think for beginner athletes, there is one training load measure that is better than all others, and that is the duration of training, the total hours trained. So that is not to say that you should chase hours for uh, the sake of chasing hours, but we're talking about monitoring training load and informing your training planning. Training planning is not a maximization problem solving for a specific metric. It's, uh, it's, it's about so much more than that. But for beginners, keep things simple you don't need to track training stress score or kilojoules or anything like that it's overkill simply monitor your weekly monthly and yearly training hours and that is the perfect train load monitoring for you for for runners i mean even kilometers they get a bad rep but but i don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily if you're a trail runner or mountain runner yeah then maybe kilometers or miles isn't that good but if you're a road runner then i think that's also a perfectly perfectly valid training load metric so i hope that explains how i look at kilojoules now the second question is about planning your workout progressions for ironman race in particular and uh, referring to the article that you linked to where the recommendation was to do some rides where you spend more expend more kilojoules than you will do in your race and what my opinion is of that uh, that concept so first of all i will link to that post it's written by a coach called chris bag and uh, it is in the episode description for those who want to go and have a look at it and as for my opinion on it it's uh, not the way i do things but but i do think there's a lot of logic to it it does make a lot of intuitive sense in many ways first if i describe how i plan the long rides that i prescribe my athletes preparing for an ironman i do base it around hours in total and the duration at race intensity those are the two things that i look at to give you an example an athlete that aims to ride at between four and a half to five hours for the ironman bike i would progress them to doing a ride that is uh, around between five and five and a half hours long and that includes around three hours of work at race intensity i would say that if the longest workout that the athlete does is just half an hour longer than their actual race duration then they probably won't end up expending the same amount of kilojoules in that training ride as they will do in racing but if it ends up being more on the one hour longer than the race then yeah they probably will expend a similar amount even maybe even slightly more but again i'm not targeting those kilojoule numbers but my main goals are the duration in total 
uh, which I want to get to race duration or even a bit longer in the types of athletes that I'm working with at least, and the time at race intensity, where I think that somewhere in the region of 60 to 70%, maybe even 75% of expected race duration is where I want it to be. So as I said, I haven't planned or looked into exactly how the kilojoules expanded in these uh, key workouts compared to the actual race kilojoules. But from my rough back of the napkin calculations, I would say that generally speaking, my athletes would be doing one to two rides of roughly similar kilojoules to the race, maybe slightly lower, maybe slightly higher, but on average, I would say maybe slightly lower and one to two rides that are of, of that level and not more. The rest of the long rides would be quite a bit more, quite a bit lower in terms of kilojoules expanded than the race. But that's not to say that I don't think that using kilojoules makes sense. I do think it makes sense. And I do like the idea of uh, of working towards progressing that number of kilojoules expanded in the workout. Uh, that's fine. I just think that you, I wouldn't do only that. I also think that you need to factor in the actual time at race intensity but i'm sure that that's maybe implicit in the in the article i read the article of course uh it doesn't necessarily say so explicitly but but i assume that yeah that's implicitly uh implicitly included there in in the article so so yeah i i would be i think that it's a, a good idea also to, to do it the way that they do it with progressing progressing the kilojoules towards race intensity i think that we might be differ a bit in how many of those hard workouts we would be doing and i wouldn't specifically target going to a more demanding number of kilojoules than the race itself whereas the author of the article clearly would do that so so there are some differences there some things where i do things differently but using kilojoules as one of the key load measures for progressing those workouts i do think in general can be a good idea so yeah uh, not not at all against that I, I think that that would absolutely work and then jesse also asks how far out i would recommend doing these big rides before the race and i would certainly recommend doing it in the period that is between two to six weeks out from the race so no closer to the race than 14 days out and no longer than six weeks out because longer than that before the race and you will probably not be able to perform that kind of work anyway otherwise if you are you might need to update your race goals so very typical uh, a very typical schedule could be to do one of these key rides five weeks out from the race and another one three weeks out from the race now the final question from jesse is what is your opinion on your longest training rides before tapering being harder than the demands of the race so i already kind of answered this i am of a different opinion than that I do think that the old adage of leaving your race out in training is a real thing that can happen. And while training should certainly work you hard and prepare you for race demands by bringing you, if not within, then at least close to within touching distance from what you do on race day. But if you're doing your race demands in training, then that either means that there's a large chance that your race will not go to plan, you did too much, or your race plan might have you sandbag pretty hard if if it's easy enough that you can also then you can repeat that workout and you can go and do the race at the same level i think that simply physiology and physics dictate that what it takes to be in a heavy block of training and and put out workouts like this it wouldn't even be possible to achieve your race performances within a hard training block like that even if you wanted to that is the reason why we taper before a race to get fresh and rested to allow our muscles our central nervous system to recover fully to restore glycogen in our muscles and uh, and light a fire of uh, racing motivation within ourselves from a psychological perspective as well that being said uh, i'm not sure that the article advocates that the hardest training day being harder than race day it might be a bit uh, poorly phrased because it says that in terms of kilojoules you should uh, you should achieve your race day demands but but actually as far as i can see it doesn't specify over how long a duration that those kilojoules would be produced so if uh, an athlete races the ironman bike in five hours but in their workout they ride for six hours to expend that same amount of kilojoules uh, that sounds about right to me uh, it's uh, close to as hard as race day uh, 
or reasonably close at least. Uh, but uh, but it's not but it's not your race. You're you're not giving up your race out there in training. So so I don't think that the article, even though it might sound like it advocates training, like doing your race in training, it's more of in this particular aspect in terms of kilojoules they they advocate for it. And I think there's a reasonable a reasonable logic behind it. And I think that probably that's what happens with the Ironman specific rides that I give to my athletes as well, even though I don't specifically target kilojoules, but I'm pretty sure that that's what happens. Also, it's important to point out here, I think that the longer the race is, the bigger the difference between your hardest training and the race itself will become. So let's take an extreme example here, because I do find that that illustrates things nicely. Let's say I coach an, an ultra runner aiming to run the 100 mile ultra trail the mont blanc race in 30 hours which would be a pretty common goal i think i would never go have them go out and run for 30 hours or 20 hours or 15 hours uh i would have to think about what i would actually do uh, but maybe i might have them go out and do a 10 hour hike as or even a run hike with some running there and some hiking in there but but that would be like at the top end of, of volume that they would do maybe a couple of times before the race but but just in terms of volume, even if, let's say, for argument's sake, that I do prescribe a 10-hour hike for the athlete, that's still 20 hours of difference, compared to, of difference compared to what they will do in the race. On the other hand, if I coach somebody to run the 1,500 meters on the track, which they might run if they're an elite athlete in 3 minutes and 30-something, 40-something, they won't do a massive amount of workouts that are as hard as the race or close to as hard as the race. But they would be doing a few, of course, where they might run 200s or 300s or even 400s at the race pace on short recoveries. Uh, so at shorter, more intense events like this, distance and time are not limiting factors, of course. But we still don't do the race in training because that is such a massive effort that even though it's all in minutes, it's not something that can be easily repeated. And especially within the same peaking phase of your training most likely we could only maybe repeat it one or two more times in other words if we do the racing training or something as hard as it then the clock is ticking on our closing performance window this uh, a similar principle not the same necessarily applies within any given race so within ironman within a marathon within a half ironman for athletes of very different levels so if you're somebody that rides the ironman bike in seven hours compared to somebody in four hours, the it looks very different how specifically you would train and how close to your race performance you would train. So if you're a seven-hour Ironman bike athlete, then I wouldn't have you do an eight-hour training ride. I wouldn't have you do a seven-hour ride either, I don't think. I would just make sure that you get enough five to six-hour rides, which would be more reasonable to recover from and, get, and, and even work into a, a schedule like a normal weekend day that you're confident in your ability to go for another hour or two on race day and still run off of that because yeah it, it would just be it just ends up being such a long event when you're riding for seven hours that training to 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 achieve those demands even just in duration let alone intensity might be a little bit too much for the training so do keep that in mind that uh, how close to training demands you work will depend a lot on both the ability of the athlete and what the specific event they're training for is all right that's it for today's q and a uh, remember that uh, if you listen to this on thursday which is thursday the 26th of november then send in your questions today or tomorrow morning friday the 27th of november to about high intensity interval training and these questions are directed to michael rosenblatt who will be my guest on next week's q a and we will answer as many high intensity interval training questions and sprint interval training questions as we can and uh, yeah that will be a lot of fun so looking forward to seeing your questions if you are looking for coaching training plans or if you want to participate in the scientific triathlon training camp on mallorca in april 2021 Go and check out the information we have on our website, scientifictriathlon.com, or email me if you need any more information about any of those products or services. Big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Remember that you can get 20% off all of their electrolyte supplements 
between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, the 27th of November and the 30th of November uh, with the code TTSFRIDAY20. And if you order for more than $100, then you can also get a free microfiber towel with that same code. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Roka's holiday sales will last through the 1st of December. Go and check out their wetsuits, trisuits, swimskins, goggles, high performance eyewear and prescription glasses. And use the opportunity now with the great offers they have going on to do some Christmas shopping. Uh, do send an email to Roka uh, if you end up buying their products that are on sale because then you can't combine it with the normal roka.com forward slash TTS given coupon code. But it's still important for uh, the podcast that Roka know that you came from us. So do let them know that that's how the show keeps being sustainable because it's a lot of a lot of hours that goes into it every single week so it's not possible without the sponsors thank you as always for listening keep training smart and keep loving triathlon